secfans.com. Week one is here. Uh, there's a lot of crap games in the SEC this week, but there's one good one, Florida State and Alabama. At least we know it's interesting. It may not end up being a good one, but it's interesting. Everybody's talking about this game, and we wanted to have a little preview of it like we do every year. We pick a couple of games each week uh, to discuss because we don't have time to cover the, the, the full conference slate. So this one, Husky, Florida State and Alabama. I got to know what you think about this one. Obviously, this is our game of the week. Uh, Florida State has got... A lot of talent coming back, and I think that's why they're ranked so highly in the preseason is coupled with the fact that they've got a great great coach, had consistency, ha- have had consistency on the field, uh, winning games uh, year in and year out, and it seems like they're poised to take that next step this year. But I wonder, when we look at an Alabama team who's been able to reload when they lose key personnel each year, uh, offense or defense, it hasn't seemed to matter to them. Is Florida State at that level that they can lose a Demarcus Walker, that they can lose a Dalvin Cook, uh, and really not feel it, kind of like Alabama? And when I say not feel it, obviously you feel when you lose a starter or a multi-year producer, but to be able to find that next man up to where you don't skip a beat, there's throughout college football history been very few teams that could do that has florida state recruited at the level that they're going to be able to do it this year i you know i don't know that they're quite you know florida state's quite alabama um you know but they can still reload to a certain degree you know there's a difference between being able to reload the way alabama did from 2015 to 2016 where you lose a reggie raglan who's an early round you know first second round draft pick linebacker and then you replace him with uh, Sean Dion Hamilton, and then you have Ruben Foster in the lineup, who's a first-round draft pick linebacker. And there just aren't many teams that can, you know, rotate guys in and out of the lineup that are, you know, you have, a, what was it, Jaron Reed and Ashawn Robinson on the line. They get replaced by um, Deron Payne, who's probably a first-round draft pick, and uh, Dalvin Tomlinson, who went, what, second round last year? And... You know, I think Florida State can reload to a large degree, and they're still going to be a very good football team. Uh, but I don't know that necessarily the guys, you know, when they lost Dalvin Cook, that they're going to have a guy that would be drafted in the first round this year, or that when they lost Demarcus Walker, that they're going to have somebody that is as good or better than Demarcus Walker this year. Um, and and that's kind of the difference between Alabama and everybody else. And it's not just the talent they recruit but it's the fact that they recruit large amounts of talent with such consistency that when they lose someone, they can generally replace them with a junior or or in many cases a senior um, that is as talented. And I I think the best example of that probably in a, you know, it's a broken record only because um, it is such a consistent theme this year and it's receiver, you know, Alabama loses our Darius Stewart. And I think he was what third or fourth round in the draft. Uh, and instead they're going to put in uh, Robert Foster into the lineup. Now, um, I, I guess no, not many Florida State fans are going to be familiar with Robert Foster, but you know they know who Calvin Ridley is, and he was the number one receiver uh, three classes ago. Um, Robert Foster was the number one receiver two classes before that. Uh, two years ago he broke his leg in the Ole Miss game when Alabama lost to Ole Miss uh, in 2015, uh, and last year coming back from an ACL injury just couldn't quite get back in the lineup. But he was the number one receiver two years ago before he broke his leg. He is a five-star player, the number one recruited his position, and he's a redshirt senior. Um, and Alabama's really the only team in the country that's going to have a five-star redshirt senior that no one knows who he is, uh, and particularly one that was already at one point a starter on the Alabama offense. Um, there's a lot more story there, actually, where uh, the, the the gist of it is basically that he pushed and yelled at Lane Kiffin and Lane Kiffin hated him. That That's kind of a fun article I read uh, earlier this year talking about that. So that's why you don't know who he is. Um, but all that said, you know, Florida State does have a tremendous amount of uh, a talent. Um, and getting back to the receiver question, and, you know, we'll kind of get into the preview in a minute, and I, I get that. But, you know, I think the, the key to this discussion is, isn't just like the defensive line and whatnot, but – you know, Kermit Whitfield, Jesus Wilson, um, particularly Travis Rudolph, were stars for them. And so the question is, 
can they take those guys and replace them with Nyquan Murray and Tate and Gavin and, and be able to produce at the same level? And I, I think that, you know, it, it's a question that we'll have to get into, but I, I think it's sort of the question that determines the outcome of the game. And you've been pretty high or low on teams this year based on wide receiver. Give me another position for Florida state that is maybe deeper than people would realize. Um, you know, another position I think is defensive line. Um, you know, there are a lot of people talking about how you can't just lose to Marcus Walker. Uh, I, I'm not sure that Florida State can't just lose to Marcus Walker and be fine. Uh, Josh Sweat and Brian Burns were pretty much devastating last year on, in their own right. I wasn't sure that Sweat at times wasn't better than to Marcus Walker. I think Walker's motor meant that late in games when teams got tired, Walker would find a way to make an impact. But Sweat would absolutely dominate the line of scrimmage at times. And it, in certain aspects, he almost seemed unblockable. So, um, yeah, I think defensive line, they're really strong. And, and defensive tackle in particular. And that's going to be an issue for Alabama in this game because I, I'm i not sure there's really any other team in the country that has the ability with their front four to control the line of scrimmage as well as Florida State. Um, and that's going to make it hard for Alabama to, you know, be able to run the ball the way they want to. And, uh you know, we all know, you know, a whole bunch of things that you, you have to do to beat Alabama. It has to be the right phase of the moon with a dual threat quarterback who, uh, you know, I, I don't know, has a, been kicked out of school the year prior. Um, but the, 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 the number one thing really is being able to stop them from running the ball at will. If Alabama can run the ball the way they want to run it, uh, nothing else is going to really matter. And if you look at those teams that beat them, you know, everybody looks at Cam Newton in 2010 Nobody looks at Nick Fairley uh, and, oh gosh, who was it? Uh, I guess that same year in 2010, who was the LSU player? Do you remember they had a nose guard that was really good? Um, yeah, well, they had a, LSU had a nose guard in 2010 and I'm drawing a blank and, uh, you know, he almost single-handedly beat Alabama. And, and the reason is if you can get in the backfield and you can prevent them from being able to run the ball up the middle, it, they just don't really always have the balance that they need to be able to, you know, kind of sustain. Uh, Drake Nevis was the guy. That's right. He was a third round pick to the Colts. And, you know, you're going to force them to throw the ball when they don't want to. And I think what we saw in the playoff was the fact that they do have some struggles throwing that football. So, yeah, I, I do think defensive line is an area where they're deeper than many people realize. And I think it's particularly problematic in this football game. It's interesting to me that you downplayed the loss of Demarcus Walker because, and maybe it's just me. I'm not the analyst um, picking a little hanging fruit. I thought he would be a huge, massive loss in terms of personnel to that team, similar to Barnett last year at Tennessee, who had the uh, who showed the capacity to take over a game, and kind of did that for a while, even against Alabama before uh, they started running away from him. Um, but for me, I saw DeMarcus Walker take over multiple games last year, and, and he not only do you lose in terms of his physical ability a special player, but you lose kind of a leader guy, a heart guy, a fourth quarter when everybody feels like crap and, and got to find somebody in the huddle to dig a little deeper. Walker was that guy for me for Florida State, um, but like you showed with Alabama – there are times where you do feel like you're going to lose a lot and somehow, some way the next year, they're, they're not a distant memory, but you kind of forget about them because the guy that's taking his place is killing it too. So that's interesting uh, to me. Uh, another player that I'd love for you to talk about a little bit that I think everybody knows for Florida State, but maybe give Alabama fans a little more in-depth sort of knowledge, and that's Derwin James, who's – everybody's all American right now uh, coming out of last season. Um, and it, clearly a special player. Are you as high on Derwin James as everybody else is? And uh, maybe just give us a little bit of a background on the guy. Sure. Uh, you know, I was looking at my phone and I have a Google phone and they have a little thing with, they go Google now where it like s suggests articles for you. Shockingly, it suggests a lot of college football articles. I know it surprised people that I read a lot of those and what popped up on my phone was like, it was an ESPN article. And it's like, you know, Florida state secret weapon, Derwin James. 
It's not a secret. And, yeah, it was like, really, really, that that was ESPN's title. And I'm like, really? What? what who in the world is that a secret weapon for at this point? Um, yeah, it, Derwin James was, I think, seventh overall recruit in his recruiting class. Uh, he's a phenomenal athlete. He's, um, he, you know, as much as he's rangy and skilled, he's freakishly strong. Uh, you know, I think he benches like over 400 pounds. Uh, and he's like a weird combination of, you know, like honey badger and Jabril peppers. Like he's, he's faster, uh, than most guys you see with his strength. He's not real big. I mean, he like, he really does like run around almost like honey badger, but he hits like a tank and just lays people out. Uh, and if you're an Alabama fan, you've watched Ronnie Harrison, it's like Ronnie Harrison that runs around like Duran Matthew and, and it's kind of terrifying for opposing teams. Now, all that said, I am not as high on Derwin James as a lot of people. Um, I think James is obviously a very good football player uh, and, and he's an extremely ta- talented football player. I think it, I, I think the hype has gotten a little bit out of hand uh, because, you know, Derwin James had his freshman season, where he, you know, was second on the team in tackles, um, and really first on the team in solo tackles, but for some reason they built him up into being like a singular sort of supernova force his sophomore year. He plays half a game against Ole Miss, um, goes out with a leg injury, and we don't see him again. And, and now, you know, coming back from that, that you know, we're we're now sort of brushing aside the fact that he's going to have to recover from an ACL um, as a secondary player. Um, and we're expecting him to immediately take over a game by himself. Um, and, and I just, I don't know. I think it's a little bit unrealistic on a lot of levels. Um, one is when you have a guy that you move around as much as you move around James, uh, much like, you know, my criticism on peppers last year, it, you almost guarantee that he's going to have a high number of tackles because you've intentionally put him in the position to get those tackles. And now he's a very good player, but I, I don't know. I, I don't, the fact that he has one career interception and it came last year in that old Miss game, um, that concerns me because I don't know that he is that phenomenal in coverage. He hasn't been able to produce. Again, there's a lot of Peppers similarities there. In fact, there's a lot of similarities in my view to, to Jabril Peppers. And, you know, when I watch him on, like, I've tried to watch as much tape as I could of Derwin James because I knew you've, you know, knew this was a big question. You know, my impression of him is he is an elite player that was very young two years ago. Um, we don't know how good he is now because he hasn't had the chance to play. Um, and I think, you know, when they u- use him close to the line of scrimmage, he can be a very active linebacker. I think he may give Alabama fits, frankly, blitzing off the edge. Um, and I say that because if, if you watched Alabama at all last year, they had a bizarre Achilles heel that if they, some, if the opposing team blitz their, uh, like nickel back, it, it would shut them down. And we, we flagged that after the LSU game. And it, I think they talked about it in the broadcast, which is probably where we got it from. But, um, they, they started blitzing Jackson off the corner repeatedly. And for whatever reason, Jalen hurts just can't deal with it. Um, and I, I watched for this, uh, some clips in the spring game cause I was curious and it looked like Alabama tried the same thing and Jalen Hurts still hadn't recovered. So I have no doubt that they're going to line Jerwin James up close to the line of scrimmage and let him be extremely active in the backfield. But that said, I don't know that he's a great cover cover player. Um, there hasn't been a lot of evidence of that coming off a leg injury. You know, I think it's a little bit questionable. So, you know, going back sort of to the same thing with the defensive line, a lot of this game to me is going to be based off the fact that if Alabama can deal with Florida state trying to get penetration and deal with their pass rush and try to hold them at bay, um, then, you know, they have the receiver talent to be able to exploit that a little bit. And I don't know that the, uh, you know, Derwin James can really match up one-on-one and Calvin Ridley. I I don't think he's that kind of player. Um, And likewise, I also think that, you know, as good as Derwin James is, I don't think enough attention is being paid to the safeties on Alabama side. I, I think Ronnie Harrison is, is very good. I think Mika Fitzpatrick is very good. A lot of people know Fitzpatrick is this like super versatile All-American. But frankly, watching clips of Derwin James, I, I kind of went back and thought, you know, I'm not really sold that he is better than Ronnie Harrison. Um, I think he's probably more athletic. 
and probably will be better than Ronnie Harrison, but I'm not sure today that he Derwin James actually is the best safety on the field. Um, and it's really not a knock on him. I, I think you just have basically three potential first round draft picks uh, at safety. And I, Derwin James is the one that's played by far the least of the three. And you got to wonder if it's better for Derwin James, if Alabama plays Florida state week six instead of week one. Yeah. I think this, you know, normally you want to play Alabama early and it's probably true here, but for uh, Derwin James in particular, it's going to be asking a lot for his first game back from a serious knee injury to immediately line up and be trying to crash into the backfield at Alabama. And at the end of the day, he is a safety and he does get caught in traffic. If you get a blocker on him, he may, you know, a couple of times, you know, when he gets a clean shot where he can blow up somebody and you know, last year against Florida, he, he came and just laid into the right tackle and knocked him flat off his feet, the right tackle on a play. Um, but that's kind of a different thing than when you're trying to scrape off blockers and traffic, which is where his size gets him in trouble. Uh, so I, I don't know, you know, all the either smart speed and stupid speed is the term I've heard before. Um, smart speed makes a play and stupid speed just runs away from the play faster. And, you know, Dur when, when you haven't been on the field in a long time and, you know, if Derwin James starts getting lost a little bit, uh, then he can end up getting caught in the wash and kind of neutralize himself. I also think it's interesting that everybody is pitting Derwin James as, like you said with ESPN, Florida State's secret weapon against Alabama when really if someone's going to take over a game and have an impact against Alabama, um, it's likely going to be on the defensive line. Uh, and I could see that happened a couple of times last year. Deshaun Hall uh, did it uh, for A&M, not Miles Garrett, surprisingly. Uh, did it for A&M. So I, 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 there's only so much a safety can do. Yes, you can put him in some interesting uh, situations. You can walk him up. You can put him in that hybrid linebacker, Peppers kind of role. But at the end of the day, he's a safety. And, you know, Alabama on the other side has, like you said, a first-round surefire lock, probably top-10 pick at, at safety. And he started out as a corner. And he's – clearly super versatile and I wouldn't say that he's going to take over a game and he's going to be the guy that we're going to talk about all offseason as being a secret weapon to take over a game no matter how good you are you are limited with your position and you have to do certain things that the position requires that don't allow you as much uh takeover ability but on the flip side for Florida State on offense we might have a situation where Alabama's running into consecutive Really strong arm quarterbacks that can move their feet. Tell Alabama fans this time around, should they be as worried about Francois as they rightly were worried about Watson in the last game they played? Well, I, you know, I think it'd be unfair to be as worried about Francois as Watson because Watson was dead gum special. Um, he, Francois, he, he started the season well. Uh, you know, it turns out that Mississippi Ole Miss game where he really came out. And uh, uh, that that's the one a lot of SEC fans probably watched was a, maybe a bit of an aberration because he, you know, Ole Miss, as it turns out, didn't really didn't have a great defense. And they collapsed the next week against Alabama. That wasn't coincidental. They collapsed the rest of the season, frankly. Um, but when you go back and look at Francois stats through the rest of the year, he was very erratic. Now he's a gunslinger. When he played Charleston Southern in week two, you know, 78% completion percentage, 8.2 yards per attempt. Great. Wonderful. Um, and you know, North Carolina had a bad defense, put up 11.6 yards per attempt, but when he played better defenses, uh, for example, Florida 5.3 yards per attempt, uh, the Louisville game was kind of a weird aberration at 5.6. Uh, but by and large, you know, just really wasn't, very consistent, was not overly effective. You know, he was only 9 of 27 in that Michigan game. Uh, that was kind of a weird one, too, because people talk about their passing game kind of exploding, and they did with Nyquan Murray with two touchdown catches. Uh, but, you know, I, I think what gets overlooked is that, you know, they completed 33% of their passes in that ball game. Um, it was very much feast or famine. Now, you know, when you're playing Alabama and they play man coverage, you do want to try to throw the ball over the top and do an isolation, but... You know, this comes back to an earlier comment that you made, uh, and hey, the re uh, again the theme for this year for me is receivers, and it's just because 
I don't really know why it worked out this way, but I there's the turnover around the country in receivers is is absolutely insane, uh, particularly in southern southeastern conference teams. But Florida State has the same problem. Um, you know, we you talked about how Demarcus Walker took over games, and I I do agree with you there. I just think that they do have, you know, what was very young talent in Sweat and Burns that I think can step into that role. The one thing that I saw that absolutely took over games for them were two guys that led their team in receiving yards, Travis Rudolph and Dalvin Cook. Um, and now everybody knew about Dalvin Cook, and everybody knows about the sort of athlete he is, and he's high in the draft. Um, I think he was an exceptional player. When when perfectly healthy, and you know we talked about this actually quite a bit, that when we thought when healthy, Cook was the better back than Fournette. Uh, two years ago, we felt like Cook was kind of robbed of a lot of Heisman hype that he should have had. Um, and, you know, I... I I, I get that why you knock a guy because he doesn't have yards because he's injured, but dad gummit cook was a freaking monster and a machine and was just completely unstoppable. But all that said at the same time, Travis Rudolph was often that unstoppable for opposing teams. You know, Rudolph had uh, twice as many yards receiving as any other player. He's the only guy. There are only two players on that team that had over 30 receptions and they were cooking Rudolph and Rudolph had 56. Um, Rudolph had, you know, a quarter of the team's receiving yards and, you know, two games in particular, Florida and Wake Forest cook Dalvin cook kept the offense going. Travis Rudolph was the reason they scored. Uh, and you know, my personal opinion on it was Travis Rudolph was the consistent go-to security blanket for Deandre Francois when he was having struggles. And, you know, looking at the fact that they wasn't a very consistent passer, the thing that is extremely concerning to me is I do not know that he won't take it. You know, I almost feel like he probably will take a step back without Travis Rudolph into that lineup. So for me, I know it's not fair. And, and for those of you, for those of you that aren't familiar with the show, we try to do everything from a stats based perspective. Uh, we look at yards per play averages um, and things like that. And we generally at the end, at the end of the, show present a model that shows you know what what a computer model says uh for who will win and then we give our gut uh we're going to do that later but first i want to talk about the only information we have that we can go by uh is is basically last year and it's not really fair to florida state to say all right this is what you did last year um but if if i'm florida state and i'm looking if i'm looking at the teams the kind of teams that beat alabama and I'm looking at the the results that last year's Florida State team had. I don't see them as a team that beats Alabama. I see them more as a team that everyone thinks will give Alabama a run and kind of falls flat. And Florida State, State fans, hang with me. Uh, I'm not going to kill you too hard, I promise. Um, but looking at their schedule, they didn't have a ranked win until – and when I say ranked, I say teams that finished the season ranked, teams that were good at the end of the year, not Ole Miss, who um, probably was a much better team than than they ended up being when they played Florida State. Anyway, they didn't end up with a ranked win until the last game of the season in Florida, uh, and I, I think we could all argue that Florida probably wasn't a top 25 team last year. So their one good win last year was a 33-32 win over Michigan, who, in my opinion, was grossly overrated. That's not Florida State's fault. Um, and I think they got a better game from Michigan uh, than – really they expected and the statistics actually didn't show that Michigan was was that competitive so the one really good win but anybody they played that was decent or good like a Clemson or a Louisville they lost gave up 37 to North Carolina gave up 63 to Louisville and obviously the 37 34 lost to Clemson now the question I have to you is is it fair to look at their last season results and say that's kind of a leading indicator that they aren't on the level of the teams that normally beat Alabama. And is it also fair to not put very much stock in that Louisville game that really just kind of got away from them and it's not indicative of the kind of team that Florida State was or is this year? Well, you know, I, I think they are, they have some of the pieces that you want from a team that can beat Alabama, namely, a fairly mobile uh, quarterback with a live arm. And when I say mobile, just fast enough to do something to negate the speed of the front seven. But, 
you know, I, I think you're also right in the fact that they don't necessarily have all the pieces. Um, now, you know, as to the Louisville game, you know, that was an implosion. Uh, at some point you have to realize that, you know, a game gets ahead of, when a, a game gets away from a team and they kind of stop playing or they, you know, they, they just fall out of hand. You start pressing, you don't play your assignments right. They were really, they were reeling from the loss of Derwin James, though. I, I still feel like that's, to per- personally, you know, the analytical side of me says that's a little bit of a cop out. You don't lose a safety and then suddenly have your your defense implode, even in one that's as versatile as James. Um, but the thing to me that was kind of striking is when they played good offenses, they struggled a little more than I think they get credit for. And a little of that was early in the year. You know, Louisville and South Florida both. You know, Louisville put up. 6.8 yards per carry beat them, you know, 63 to 20. But even the next week against South Florida, which by the way, you know, depending on the poll did finish ranked um, South Florida put up seven over seven yards of carry in, in that game. And then later in the season, you know, they kind of, I, you know, I almost wonder if they switched defensive priorities and then buckle down more on the run, but you had several teams uh, that, you know, you had North Carolina putting up 7.7 yards per play. Clemson put up 6.3. Uh, North Carolina State put up 5.7. And then they finished the season with Boston College, who had no offense whatsoever. Uh, Syracuse, who was just terrible. Florida, who was offensively a train wreck. Uh, and then Michigan. And they, you know, defensively were great in those games. But outside of Michigan, and I, I say outside of because it's really questionable how good off Michigan's offense really was none of those teams had an offense uh, to speak of. So, um, you know, it, it's great to hold Wake Forest and Boston College and Syracuse to low, you know, yard per play stats. But I, I think you were a little bit right. And like we, you know, as we discussed, one of the big things that you have to do when you play Alabama is you've got to be able to really stop the run. And I think they did that for the most part, but I'm also not sure it was a huge accomplishment to do so. Uh, but much more importantly, if you want to beat Alabama, you really need a pretty high percentage passer that that makes a lot of impactful plays. Now, they had a very high yard per attempt average. They generally were over eight yards per, per attempt in most games. But again, I don't know that you can totally throw out the Louisville game just because the schedule was, frankly, very weak. Um, and, you know, I think Francois, one of his best games may have been the Clemson game and that near loss. Uh, and I'm, I'm not sure what that says about Clemson either way, because their pass defense wasn't always um, so elite. Uh, you know, so Alabama couldn't throw the ball. Uh, but, you know, Florida pretty well limited uh, Florida State in the passing game. So I don't know. I, I don't know that I totally agree with you that they aren't the type of team, because I think to some degree they are. Uh, but I also think that they're they're almost too much like Alabama. They're not the weird like Texas A&M you know, whirl it down the field, a uh, crazy play offense or old mi- old mess that's giving them fits. They're they're kind of similar to Alabama and they play a kind of similar style of football. That's not always a good thing. So let me ask you this, because generally when I, in my mind, rank a team or, or determine whether or not uh, they're, they're fit for the ranking that they have, I, I like to look at how they did against teams that were supposed to give them a game and then how they did against teams that they were supposed to kill. Um, The one that I always go back to is the 2012 season, 2012 season with Notre Dame, who they were sneaking by a lot of really crappy teams. Um, And it really didn't bite them in the butt until they played a not crappy team in the national championship game. But for me, tell me if this is fair. Wake Forest 17-6, NC State 24-20, and Miami 2019. Those are average to below average teams that were in it at the very end with a team that should have beat the crap out of them on paper. And I know there's some ACC fans that are going to be like, look, these are better teams than you realize. They're not. And we're not talking about teams that are good enough to make a bowl. We're talking about if you're a number two team in the country, 
the number 37 team or the number 54 team shouldn't be on the field with you. They should lose by three touchdowns because there's, sh- there is that big of a gap between the second best team in the country and everybody else. And I'm not talking about snapping up one game here or there where you play really well or really bad. I'm talking about a consistent pattern. Is that something that, that maybe has more weight than the lack of big wins is the fact that they struggled against three pretty middling teams. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think that's that's pretty fair. Uh, of the last nine games they played, five of the last nine were within a touchdown. And, you know, of those, uh, only Michigan was, uh, well, I guess, you know, Clemson too. You had, you, Michigan and Clemson were ranked opponents. Three were unranked, uh, and they did whip Florida. But again, you know, really, Florida really was a train wreck. Poor um, Florida. Yeah, poor God bless them, uh, and I'm sure many Florida State fans are. Hopefully, they take appreciation from the <laughs> uh, suffering Florida. Florida suffers, and I think most Florida fans at this point have kind of gotten to some sort of dark place where they find humor in it themselves. But, um, you know, I, I mean, I agree with you, and it, it's kind of an odd thing. And I think, you know, we've talked about this a lot. We talked about it a lot last year in regard to the Big Ten uh, going into the postseason with Michigan and Ohio State that with this whole conference expansion thing and conferences consolidating the one of the flip sides to it is there've been a lot more bad teams and conferences now than there were 15 years ago. And a a lot of teams like, you know, it possibly Florida state last year, they kind of get propped up by the fact that there are, you know, four or five really terrible teams on the schedule in conference play. You know, like the the Boston College game, the Syracuse game. Now, I think the ACC is pretty consistent. I don't want ACC fans to think we're poo-pooing Florida State or the ACC in general, because um, if you go back and listen to our last thing we did on the SEC previewing it, we we kind of trashed most teams in the SEC this year. Um, <laughs> but you know, the reality of it is, like, it, it really is what you just said, right? If you're the number two team in the country, you should dominate most teams on your schedule, and especially like a number thirty-five team. Um, I, we have been saying for the past few years, and it feels like it's increased even more this year. There is not as much parity in college football as there were, there was 10 years ago. Um, the haves have a pretty good distance from the have nots and, you know, the bottom of the ACC is still not particularly good. Um, and outside the very bad teams, Florida state really didn't put a lot of teams away. Um, and they lost a few games they really shouldn't have. So, uh, you know, when you take those two things and you put them together, um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, there's there's a real chance that there's more hype than there should be. I, I don't know that that's really fair. I still think Florida State's a very good football team. But I also think, you know, maybe you bring up a valid point that when it gets on the field with Alabama and they go line up, that it turns out a little bit like the, you know, I'm not saying it's going to be the 52-6 blowout we saw last year with Alabama, but it's a little bit similar that I think USC fans and USC was shell shocked when they got on the field with Alabama because they did not realize that as talented as they were compared to the level of competition they faced in the Pac-12, they were still significantly outmatched against Alabama as everyone is at this point in college football. Um, and you know they they just couldn't handle it and they kind of collapsed into a shell. And one of the challenges for Florida State is as talented and as good as they are across the board, how well does a team that is used to being better than all their opponents handle it when they play a team that they are truly inferior at, at most positions in size, speed, and strength? Um, because there have been there've been a lot of teams, and one of the biggest challenges when you play Alabama is to mentally be able to understand that you are the underdog um, and you have to take risks and shots. And if you feel like you're going to line up and smash them in the mouth, you're going to lose and you, you can't get disheartened by that early. And the flip side of that is a lot of teams that have either been beaten Alabama or, or really made it interesting over the last few years played with that kind of reckless abandon and they, in their minds felt like they've already lost the game. So just full throttle it. And it turned out to be a pretty good uh, strategy and kept them in the game. So we're not saying that Florida State is going to get steamrolled in this game or that they're just an inferior team because they're not. What we're saying is these are things we've seen in the past and we're trying to think of how what Florida State has to do 
to compete with Alabama on the field or mentally to change or, or to accommodate a, a team like that. So we've talked a lot about Florida State. Uh, and, and generally when we do these big out-of-conference matchups, we tend to focus more on the other team because the the people that are listening to us because we're SEC focused already know their team. Uh, but let's get into Alabama a little bit before we do scores on this. Um, Jalen Hurts coming off a pretty a, a pair of pretty bad uh, performances, at least throwing the ball. Um, we did an extensive review of Jalen Hurts coming back as a quarterback, so we don't need to get too much into detail there. But if you're looking at Florida State's counter- counterpart in Francois, how does Jalen Hurts stack up to him? And then let's talk about Jalen Hurts plus offensive line, because I know that was a big thing with Florida State last year had some holes there and their quarterback got beat up over the course of the season. If you're looking at those units together, so Alabama's offensive line plus quarterback and Florida State's offensive line plus quarterback, um, how do those two stack up? You know, there's there's a little bit of a question mark here because Florida State's offensive line does have has had a lot of turnover. Um, they're banged up right now in fall camp. They may get healthy. There's a lot of signs they will be. Uh, but they were, you know, they were a little disappointed last year with some of the guys like Rubel, a tackle, and they lost, you know, probably their most dependable uh, offensive lineman and Roderick Johnson at left tackle. So considering that the offensive line struggled to protect uh, the quarterback last year, I don't know that they're going to protect him this game. Now, you know, the flip side of that, of course, is I don't know how well Alabama's pass rush is going to recover, particularly if Christian Miller currently has a hamstring injury. I think that might actually be I actually think Christian Miller's ha- hamstring injury, this is kind of an aside, maybe one of the more important points in this ball game. But um, And ironically might be more devastating than Davis's gunshot wound. Yeah, yeah. Well <laughs> Yeah, the the fun fact there, of course, is that Alabama's undefeated uh, in seasons where their starting defensive end was shot in fall camp. Um that that, that happened in their two thousand nine uh, national championship run. I can't believe the same that would happen to a team twice in the course of 10 years, but you know, roll tide. Uh, anyway, yeah, with the quarterbacks, it, it's kind of weird. Cause in some ways they're like athletically kind of similar. Uh, you know, Francois is a pretty powerful guy. Um, he's not huge. He's not nearly as big as Jalen hurts, uh, just in terms of, you know, like muscle mass, but, uh, you know, pretty, prototypical sort of build. He's strong armed and a very different skill set. So, you know, Francois was extremely tough to take the hits. He did keep on ticking. Um, he can make pretty much any throw in the field at any given moment, but isn't necessarily very consistent or accurate making those throws. Uh, there's a lot of signs that he's gotten better about his timing, but again, the problem with get building timing is you really need time in the pocket to build timing. Um, and I don't think last year did him any favors when you, we've talked about this a lot. If you take a quarterback and you put him in a bad situation, um, if they're not used to making reads, so they think too slowly. And particularly if the offensive line's bad, what tends to happen is they don't learn to progress, to make progressions the way they're supposed to and set their feet. Uh, and they get trigger happy and they don't make reads properly because they're in the back of their mind, that clock ticks way too fast. Um, and they feel like they got to get rid of it. Uh, Jalen hurts you know, we talked about this a lot. And as you said, we kind of broke him down already. The, they ran an offense that threw it. uh, They had a higher percentage of throws behind the line of scrimmage than any other team in college football last year. That's a fact. And Jalen hurts benefited greatly from that statistically, but when he had to throw down the field, he really struggled. Now, as we talked about in the, you know, I'm basically saying this for the basic at this point for the benefit of a lot of Florida state fans and people that if you're an Alabama fan, you should go back and listen to our, uh, breakdown about Jalen Hurts as a quarterback because there's a lot more detail there but his biggest problem in my view wasn't really even so much talent it's just hesitancy as a true freshman he didn't know where his reads were he didn't know where the receiver was going to be and when he went out to throw he would not have his feet set right and so he there was there was a second where he had to set his feet or, or I guess let me take it back it would take him one count two count to look one count find the receiver two count look around the receiver and make sure the DB isn't closing in because Jalen hurts wasn't comfortable enough to know where the coverage would be mid play three count to reset his feet four count to throw Deandre Francois is going to have that ball out in two counts and hurts gets it out in four. And there were a lot of opportunities hurts had to complete passes where he either one missed the opportunity and, but actually far more common two 
he made throws way more difficult because he had a guy that was quite open close or at an easy point uh launch point that he waited and he left the window and now the guy is largely covered or is a very difficult launch point and then he has struggled to make the throw so uh you know all that said you you do have the added dimension of a dual threat quarterback and you talked about looking at florida state in the past uh one of the big things in this game is we you know however much jalen hurts improves as a passer he's still a dual threat guy and I think Derwin James is a devastating player to have on the perimeter in, in the, uh, you know, the perimeter run game and the zone read game because he is so fast and disruptive. But at the same time, Florida State really struggled with a lot of dual threat quarterbacks that they faced last year. And, you know, the the one thing that Alabama really pushed in the spring game, right, that kept talking about is the deep ball. And I truly believe it's because Florida State really needs to be able because the offense, you know, the backs may be great, but the offensive line, frankly, is, isn't super hot and they're not going to be able to get a run game uh, going head on with the, the Alabama front seven. It's just not going to happen. They need to have a continually good passing game to make those linebackers take their first step back into coverage and not their first step towards the line of scrimmage to be successful. Alabama with Derwin James in the line of scrimmage or whatnot. I guarantee you Florida state is they're going to load the box. They're going to go man up and they're going to put forward, put Derwin James in the box to disrupt the perimeter run game with Jalen Hurts and those running backs, that zone read game and that sweep game where they can use, you know, you use the running back as an extra blocker. So you put Derwin James in there to make up for the numbers advantage. The problem there is that Florida state necessarily leaves themselves in cover one or cover zero at best. They have single safety at worst. They maybe have no safety. So a lot of that offensively for Alabama is if if Jalen Hurts is improved enough where he can deliver the deep ball with accuracy, considering that the number, the amount of skill they have at receiver, um, you know, Jalen Hurts is going to be able to compete several deep passes uh, that are going to go for a lot of yards. Again, this is a schematic issue. I don't know that Hurts necessarily has to be all world with it. He's just going to have the opportunity. But last year, he really couldn't complete that pass. No matter how open the guy was, he missed every deep pass by 10 yards. Um, so, I think Francois has a tremendous amount more asked of him in summary uh, in the passing game. He has to do a lot more. He's not, ha doesn't have nearly as much asked of him in the run game, but he has to still evade tacklers because the offensive line isn't fantastic. Hertz has a lot more asked of him physically, but he is going to be asked to do far less as a passer. Um, and if, if he can execute at that level, Basically, Hertz can have a substantial impact in the ball game with a minimal amount of improvement at success, whereas Francois has to have a very high level of success to have a moderate impact in the ball game. That's a pretty good take on that. And the the last little summary you said sort of put it into perspective for me. So one more thing I want to put to you before we get into predictions, um, just to kind of give a good idea of where these personnel units are. Give me an area where Alabama has a significant advantage that people may not think they have uh, matching up against Florida State. And give me an area where Florida State has an advantage where people may not think they have. Um, and since we don't didn't discuss these uh, ahead of time, I'm actually stalling a little bit to give you some time to think about it. But that time is up. Let me know. Okay. Well... You know, I think I'll start with where I think Florida State has an advantage. And I think Florida State will have an advantage on edge penetration on Alabama. You know, they have a very good... Alabama has a good left tackle, Jonah Williams. The right tackle spot is undis, is a little unclear. And I think Alabama may have a tough time getting the edge in Florida State. And that was a huge part of their offense last year. I don't know what it's going to look like under Dable, but I, I think that's a pretty significant thing. Now, to flip... Uh, the sides of the football a little bit and talk about an area where, you know, maybe Alabama has a significant advantage that Florida State may not realize. Um, I guess there's two things that I think about. One, I'll, I'll throw out two. One, I think Alabama's tight ends may be better than people appreciate based off what I've heard. Uh, and, and I think they may, in Dable's background, you know, Rob, he was Gronk's coach. And I think they may use tight ends quite a bit in the, the passing game. And I've heard a lot of very good things about the young tight ends that Alabama has now. But the other thing I would think that may surprise a lot of Florida State fans is just how fast 
uh, Alabama's linebacking core is. Um, if they're healthy, uh, Rashawn Evans and Christian Miller and those, uh, particularly the the Jack linebackers who is Terrell used to be Hall, now it's Lewis. Um, those guys are fast and disruptive. Uh, and I've heard that quietly Rashawn Evans has become the best player perhaps on the football team at, at inside linebacker. Uh, and, you know, there's a lot of talk about Cam Akers, who's a very fast player and very quick, but I, I almost guarantee you there's going to be some play in this game where they put in Akers as the backup tailback and go on a, a power sweep, and they're going to be shocked because Rashawn Evans is going to run him down. Um, and I say they're going to be shocked because they didn't see it in the spring game, and frankly, Florida State is not as fast as Alabama, and I don't think they're going to realize that you know, Alabama's linebackers are, and particularly the hard hitting safeties they have are quite as fast and disruptive as they are. All right. We've got to wrap this one up. It's getting close to midnight as we record this and we want to get it out for everybody to see or hear. So let's get into predictions. Everybody probably, I think week three or week four, we'll start. We'll have enough data compiled that we can produce a computer model Right now, though, it's just gut, and I guess there's nothing more to talk about. Just give me your score, Alabama, Florida State. What you got? Um, personally, I think the score is going to be, and this is a blind guess, but I'm going to say Alabama 24, Florida State 10. Um, I think Florida State's going to move the ball better than that indicates. I I'm just not sold about a team that doesn't have great receivers trying to move the ball down the field. And I, I think they may stall quite a bit, but you know, and I, I feel like I have to note this for the Florida state fans listening. Usually we have computer models. We look at a lot of statistics and I, I run some predictions. Uh, unfortunately it's the first game of the season. We don't have any stats. So this is just a blind guess. Um, and I don't consider it to be a particularly accurate in any way, but I, I'm just going to go with 24 to 10 and, and you know, we'll see where it rolls. So I'm kind of in there in terms of the spread, but I think both teams score more. I've got Alabama 35, uh, Florida State 20. Um, And it sounds like, Florida State fans, it sounds like we're killing your team. We're picking basically double the spread, but we're generally pretty pretty accurate. Um, We were, I think, even, even in the ones we missed last year, like, like the uh, national championship game, we, we called it when it was close. Uh, I think Florida State has the potential to win this game. Namely, I think they lose this game because of the things I said about what I saw in their season last year, playing crappy teams close. But I also think there's some of the LSU factor at play here where LSU can just – roll a clunker out there three games a year lose two out of those three to teams you've never heard of uh and then play alabama down to the absolute wire or maybe even beat them like in uh that one time a long time ago um so that being said i think alabama wins the game i think they win it pretty comfortably late uh, i do think they give up more points because we, we're we're seeing with alabama there's a lot of new faces there so there's going to be some some ironing out the wrinkles um and again i think i think florida state's got a lot of talent and sometimes that talent can really match up toe-to-toe with alabama i don't see it happening but i would not be shocked if this game was super tight late in the fourth quarter um we'll see with that you got anything else on this game or we're ready to wrap it up Uh, I, i think i'll throw one last little tidbit in um and that's, I'm going to be really curious to see what Alabama does in the secondary when they're playing uh, Florida State. Yeah, you know, they've been moving around Fitzpatrick a lot, and they keep talking about his versatility because he's practicing one position or another position. But something I, I, I kind of got curious, so I started digging into it. They have uh, Trayvon Diggs and a walk on um, rotating at one of the corner spots, uh, Levi Wallace. And. I'm actually curious if they're going to start the, everyone assumes Fitzpatrick and Harrison will be the two main corners. Tony Brown will be nickel. um, And then Trayvon Diggs and Averett will be the outside corners. I'm not 100% sold that they are 100% sold on that lineup. And it wouldn't shock me if Fitzpatrick actually plays corner or nickel in this game. Um, So I don't know. That's just one 
random thought I have to keep an eye out. And and it kind of makes sense because Hootie Jones would kind of, I guess, fill in that role. And he's actually played a good bit uh, and played pretty well um, for the Florida State fans that didn't see Alabama's spring game. um, Diggs got absolutely embarrassed multiple times. Now, he was going up against some really talented wide receivers and the quarterbacks weren't facing a blitz early in that game. But... Man, it wasn't pretty, and kind of like you, we haven't heard that that sort of follow up, comforting commentary that sometimes you hear from coaches. We haven't heard that from Nick Saban on digs. You know, he'll say here and there he's he's had an okay day of practice or whatever, but we haven't heard that. Man, the guy you saw in the spring is not the guy we got right now. Um, I think long term they think he's the guy because he's such a freak athlete, but. I wouldn't be shocked. That would be interesting uh, to see that. Um, And it does speak to Fitzpatrick's versatility. All right, y'all. This weekend, Saturday, huge game. I think that's all we got to talk about on this one. But thanks so much for watching and or listening. Obviously, if you liked it, we want you to hit that like button. If you didn't like it, give us a thumbs down. That's fine. But also give us a comment and tell us what we got wrong. Thanks so much, y'all. Have a great week. God bless. Thank you.